uh, Professor Michal Hauser from University College London, where he is a professor of neuroscience. He's going to speak about all optical interrogation of neural circuits. Did I summarize that okay? Perfect. It's the right talk? Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. My group is interested in cracking the neural code. In other words, the rules by which information is processed in neural circuits. This is a tremendous challenge because neural circuits are very complicated. They consist of many different cell types which are in interconnected in complex ways. And moreover, the activity patterns that take place in neural circuits, for example, when you're listening to this lecture, embrace thousands to millions of neurons on the millisecond time scale. So this is a really hard problem. So the great molecular biologist Francis Crick, who cracked the genetic code, suggested that the way to attack this problem is by using light. And in a series of lectures at UCSD nearly 20 years ago, he outlined two strategies for using light one to read activity, and one to write activity in neural circuits. And this is the same um, review in Philosophical Transactions that Gero mentioned in his lecture. And in the same review, he both outlined the strategy for reading activity from neural circuits, and also for manipulating activity in neural circuits with light. In the past 10 years, there's indeed been a revolution in our ability to use light to both read and manipulate activity in neural circuits. Now, the advantage of using light is obvious. So first of all, light is non-invasive. It avoids the need for direct contact with the tissue. Light is inert. It doesn't interfere with normal neural function outside the retina. It's highly precise. You can achieve outstanding spatial resolution, even now down to nanometers with super-resolution microscopy. Light is also multiplexable. You can use different wavelengths for different functions. And in combination with the use of genetically encoded probes, you can target specific sets of cells and even subcellular compartments by localizing the probes to the right cells or the right compartments in cells. So <clears throat> on the recording side, using a combination of one photon and two photon microscopies and calcium sensors, now genetically encoded calcium sensors, we can now read out population activity from neural circuits in awake behaving animals, as shown in the last talk by Mark Schnitzer. In parallel, there's been a revolution in our use of light to control neural circuits. And this is, of course, the optogenetic revolu revolution, which was pioneered and introduced today by Gary Miesenbeck. And this allows us to use light to change the activity, either to increase or decrease the activity in genetically defined neural populations with millisecond precision. And this is um, the protein that has captured um, the attention of the neuroscience community, channel rhodopsin, which allows you to use blue light, such as that illuminating the stage here, to activate neurons with millisecond precision. However, it's important to note that these two twin revolutions in our ability to use light to interrogate neural circuits have proceeded more or less in parallel. It's been very difficult for us to both read out and manipulate activity from the same neurons in vivo at the same time. And this is crucial if we are to make causal links between specific activity patterns and behavior, which we need to do in order to crack the neural code. So the challenge we have is to be able to simultaneously record and manipulate neural activity in a crosstalk-free manner from the same genetically defined sets of neurons in vivo during behavior. In other words, to combine the recording and manipulation revolutions that have taken place in neuroscience in the last 10 years. And so here I'd like to outline a dream experiment for this all-optical revolution. Here we have a schematic of a neural circuit in vivo in an awake mouse, where we co-express an activity sensor, for example, a genetically encoded calcium sensor or a voltage sensor, as outlined by Mark, and an opsin to allow us to manipulate the same neurons. And we want to be able to go in 
and select individual neurons for manipulation by activating the opsin, as shown here, without directly affecting the neighboring neurons in the circuit. So this is the, the benchmark, the, the dream experiment that we're aiming for. And if we can achieve this, we can then target optogenetic manipulation to ensembles of neurons, not just based on this, their genetic signature, but on their functional profile. And again, this is crucial to make causal links between those activity patterns in those genetically defined and functionally defined populations and the behavior. So here, in order to crack this problem, we need a combination of techniques, which we call the All Optical Toolkit. And this uh, schematic is taken from a re review that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience um, a few months ago and outlines the different elements you need for this All Optical Toolkit. First, we need probes for both recording and manipulation of neurons in vivo, and we now have a very attractive palette of different sensors of both calcium and voltage um, that can be implemented in vivo. Um, we also have um, a family of different probes for both activating and inactivating populations of neurons optogenetically. Next, we need to express these probes in the right sets of cells. And again, we have a range of strategies for achieving this, including electroporation, the use of viruses, and the use of uh, transgenic animals. And finally, we need to target light to individual neurons in vivo in order to be able to simultaneously read out and manipulate activity in the right sets of neurons. And again, there's a range of optical strategies for achieving this. And I just want to highlight um, a device that we've been using in our own experiments to achieve this. It's a device called the Spatial Light Modulator, which is basically a programmable diffraction grating, which allows you to send beamlets of light in a precisely targeted way into the tissue in order to both read out and manipulate activity. And here's some examples how, of, of how we're using the spatial light modulator in our lab to produce different patterns of light. And with apologies to Francis Crick, this is an image um, of Francis Crick in the bottom right. So here now is the dream experiment, um, which we've implemented in my lab. <clears throat> this is um, in a high fixed mouse where we've ex co-expressed a calcium sensor, a genetically encoded calcium sensor, GCAMP6, and a, an opsin, a variant of channel rhodopsin called C1V1, which enables two-photon activation of individual cells in vivo. So <clears throat> now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in to this neural circuit and identify individual cells for optical manipulation and readout of activity. And we're going to use an electrophysiological approach recording from one of these cells to provide ground truth of the activity pattern in that cell. And the aim now is to activate a single action potential in our target neuron, neuron 1, without directly affecting the neighboring neurons, neuron 2 and neuron 3. Here's the result. The top trace shows you a record from the electrophysiological recording from neuron 1. And you can see that during the photostimulation, the optogenetic activation of neuron 1, we can very reliably and very precisely activate single action potentials in the target neuron. And in the bottom right, you can see the readout, the simultaneous readout of activity with two photon imaging from neurons 1, 2, and 3, with the calcium indicator, GCAMP6, reporting the activity in the individual neurons. And you can see that we have selectively activated neuron 1 without directly perturbing the neighboring neurons 2 and 3. So this shows you a proof of principle experiment that we can simultaneously read out and manipulate activity with single neuron, single action potential precision in an awake behaving mouse in vivo. So we can, of course, now with the spatial light modulator, split our beam and activate not just a single target neuron, but multiple neurons in the field of view. And here's an experiment where we've targeted 10 neurons for simultaneous optogenetic manipulation, which we can now do simultaneously with the readout of activity. And you can see from the bottom traces that each of the 10 target neurons are reliably activated by our optogenetic uh, uh, targeting of light to the individual neurons. And now we can simultaneously read out the activity patterns 
in the local circuit using two photon imaging and look at functional connectivity patterns in this neural circuit. So here we have an, another experiment where we've targeted 10 cells for simultaneous optogenetic manipulation, simultaneous to readout of activity from the local circuit. And you can see that while we're reliably activating the 10 cells, you can see that there are some cells in the local circuit, such as the cell outlined with a yellow circle, which also seem to show activity driven by activation of our ensemble of 10 cells. So these are uh, follower cells, functionally connected cells, and this shows us that we can use this approach to look at functional connectivity patterns in the intact brain in the awake behaving mouse. Next, we can perform this kind of interrogation during different behavioral states. And these experiments were done in a head-fixed mouse. Um, this is now imaging barrel cortex in a mouse which is running on a styrofoam treadmill. And we can now interrogate the same neurons and look at how the responsiveness to the same pattern of stimulation changes during different behavioral states. For example, while the animal is at rest or while it's running on the treadmill. And we can show that, for example, the, the responsiveness, the gain of the neuron to a particular stimulus is enhanced while the animal is running on the treadmill. Next, we can also implant a so-called chronic window above the region of interest. And this allows us to do long-term experiments. And we've developed several tricks for being able to localize exactly the same circuit over long time periods. This is now showing you the same neural circuit in mouse barrel cortex where we can identify the same uh, individual neurons in the circuit and then target them for uh, photostimulation um, over a time delay of, of a week. And this shows you the response of the highlighted neuron in the bottom to the same photostimulus on day one and day eight. You can see it's practically identical. Here's the uh, population data showing you that for a large uh, number of neurons, we, we can achieve reproducible responses to the same photostimulus, and we can target individual neurons reliably over long time periods. And this now puts us in the position to be able to look at changes during plasticity of the network dynamics in response to activating the same target neurons. Finally, one of the most appealing and attractive uses of this technology is to be able to target particular sets of neurons based not on their functional, not on their genetic profile, but on their functional identity. And this is a, a proof of principle experiment showing you that this is possible. Um, this is now uh, a network of neurons, again, in mouse barrel cortex. And it's been shown in previous work that different neurons in barrel cortex, which receive input from the whiskers, are selective for different orientations of stimulations of the whisker of the mouse. Some are more responsive to vertical deflections of the whiskers. Some are more responsive to horizontal deflections of the whiskers. And we can first use calcium imaging to identify the different populations, um, which we've coded with, uh, with symbols on the left-hand and plot. And then we can ask the question, uh, how are the responsive response patterns of these different classes of neurons different? And there is indeed um, a significant fraction of neurons in barrel cortex, which is either unselective to the orientation of, of the, the stimulus, or indeed unresponsive to whisker stimulus. And we can ask the question, is that because these neurons are simply taken out of the circuit because they're, for example, inexcitable? And so what we can do now is we can use our map of the functional ensembles in the circuit to target our photostimulation to particular kinds of neurons, which we functionally defined. And here, this experiment shows that uh, we can actually reject the null hypothesis because the responsiveness of these different classes of neurons um, to the same photostimulus is actually indistinguishable statistically, ruling out the null hypothesis that the unresponsive cells are uh, simply inexcitable. So this opens up the door to some really exciting experiments. And there's a vast range of different possibilities now for targeting optogenetic stimulation to just the right cells based on their functional definition. Um, and one of the most uh, appealing possibilities is to be able to shorten the feedback loop between readout of activity and targeting of activity to particular neurons uh, to be fast enough that you can achieve real-time closed loop control of activity patterns in vivo during behavior. And here's a proof of principle experiment that shows that this might be possible. 
Here's a field of view showing a network of neurons in mouse visual cortex, the area of the, the, the mouse brain specialized for visual processing. Here we've defined um, four uh, trigger neurons where we're very rapidly reading out, using fast algorithms to read out the activity patterns in these uh, four trigger neurons and using our fast detection of activity in these neurons to target photostimulation to downstream sets of neurons um, shown in the traces below. And so we think that by um, refining these techniques for real-time uh, closed-loop control of neural circuits, we should be able to manipulate activity patterns on the fly as they evolve, for example, during a decision-making process. And ultimately, this may put us in the position to develop improved real-time optical brain-machine interfaces. So finally, um, I've shown you a new strategy for all optical interrogation of neural circuits. This allows us to target optogenetic manipulation to neurons based not just on their genetic signature, but on their functional signature, and should finally allow us to recapitulate the natural spatiotemporal patterns of activity that actually occur in circuits in the intact brain during behavior. And this should allow us to close the loop between readout of activity, manipulation activity, and behavior. And to borrow Mark's musical analogy, by being able to record the song that is being played in the cortex from particular sets of cells with the right uh, temporal and spatial resolution, uh, we can now uh, replay this song in the same circuit and look at which elements of the spatiotemporal pattern of activity are the most important for defining the neural codes in cortical circuits during behavior. So uh, finally, I'd like, I'd like to end by thanking the really wonderful uh, team, um, the all optic optical team in my lab that has made these experiments possible, and also the funders of this work. And thank you very much.